Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our conference, No Borders, No Barriers, and a very warm welcome to the Stern FinTech community. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathleen DeRose, and I'm the director of the Fubon Center for Technology, Business, and Innovation, and a finance professor here at Stern leading our FinTech programs. We are so unbelievably proud to be a leading FinTech university and to have reached thousands of undergrads, MBAs, execs, and alum with our FinTech curriculum. So FinTech, since its wellspring in the financial crisis, it's matured and actually delivered on many of the original promises to democratize finance. And yet FinTech is still full of surprises and contradictions. In fact, we have the paradox today of Bitcoin's giant rally. And on the one hand, feverish speculation, and yet at the same time, representing actual institutionalization of traders hedging against future inflation. And we have the likely development of central bank digital currencies, which will effectively turn monetary systems and payment systems into Trojan horses with the traveling of convenience, but also the risk of programmable money. And on the one hand, we have traders gathering on Reddit and gamified apps like Robinhood, speculating and creating short squeezes. And at the same time, we have Robinhood, which is deeply embedded in traditional market infrastructure and has to abide by the usual regulations. So FinTech and the borders and barriers of old and new finance are constantly shifting. And that's our theme today. So our theme today of no borders, no barriers, it really has three components that you'll hear about throughout the conference. First, there's the idea that technology requires no passport. And certainly the last year of the pandemic has both challenged and confirmed this as we've seen the emergence of rival fintech spheres around the world. We have panelists and speakers today from all over the place, from Argentina and Israel and the Netherlands, the UK, and of course the US. And they'll help inform you about what those borders and barriers look like around the world. The second component is that we firmly believe that interdisciplinary research, research that combines computer science and finance and data science and artificial intelligence, is incredibly important and valuable today to both the academy and society in times of such great change. So today you'll hear from leading academic researchers discussing the developments of Bitcoin and blockchain and artificial intelligence where the borders are certainly blurred between humans and machines. And our third theme as part of our No Borders, No Barriers conference is that academics and practitioners gathering together in one room is a very special and rare opportunity to travel into unfamiliar terrain and to learn from each other. So our presenters, our practitioner panels, our keynotes, our startup demos, our lunch and table topics, all provide you an opportunity to do just that. So I wanna take a brief moment also to give the chance to thank our founding donor, Richard Tsai, an NYU alum, without whom the Fubon Center and this conference wouldn't be possible. I'd also like to thank our FinTech Advisory Board, which has been incredibly supportive of events like this and of our overall curriculum. It's now my huge pleasure to introduce our starting keynote speaker, Kunal Kapoor, the CEO of Morningstar. So Kunal has been with Morningstar over 25 years, starting in the investment management and research division and rising through a series of senior, senior roles to his leadership of the firm as CEO beginning in 2017. Since then, he's led a series of FinTech acquisitions and sustainable growth for the company. I'm very pleased to introduce Kunal. Kunal, take it away. Thank you, Kathleen. I very much uh, appreciate the introduction. Thanks. Um, you know, it's a beautiful morning here in Chicago. And so I hope wherever you are, uh, you, you two are uh, experiencing a little bit of spring or some warmth as we continue uh, through this unusual time. Uh, my presentation today is going to be a little reflective and a little forward looking. And I say that because last year at this time, one of the first events that was canceled on my calendar as we started to go into um, a global lockdown, if you will, uh, was this very event. And I remember speaking to a number of folks at that time, and we said, okay, well, we'll see you next year uh, at the event. But here we are a year later, and uh, we're doing this remotely. And I think the lesson in that is we've adapted and we're ready to go regardless uh, of the circumstances. And my speech will reflect that uh, very much uh, today as well. And so 
when I look back at my notes and what an experience all of this has been, um, you're going to hear me talk uh, about how 2020 has immeasurably changed our context. We'll always remember the past year for our shared experiences, but we'll also come to see it as a time of great significance, uh, including in the intersection of finance and technology. Now, I think of 2020 as the year when the power of the individual investor reached an all-time high. And I don't say this lightly, because at Morningstar, we've always taken the individual investor very, very seriously. And we've always believed that the individual has had more power than what Wall Street has allowed for. There's always this joke about Main Street or Wall Street, and the reality is that Wall Street is far, far, um, you know, I think, in, in, in far, far along the way in underestimating the power of the individual, but no more, I think. Um, and, and so I thought today I'd spend a little time talking about three trends that are empowering the investor and allowing Morningstar to fulfill its mission of empowering investor success. And I'll share a little bit about what I would have said here last year on each of these topics. And more importantly, and what I think you'll want to hear is what I've learned since then. So the first of those trends is that the pool of investors is growing wider and deeper. Think about that for a second, more investors across the board. So deeper and wider. Real or perceived barriers to entry are melting away with frictionless trading, dropping of fees all the way down to zero in many instances, fractional shares and democratized access to data and insights. You have ideas such as banking as a service, BAS come to life, you have firms like Elevest, which appeals to female investors, driving a very focused way around which they're bringing their value proposition to investors. And then you have the allure of new things such as cryptocurrency that are drawing a crowd and, and basically generating a shift in deeper kinds of investor activism. All of that is still true. But if you look at Google search queries over the past year, you'll see a surge in terms such as learning to invest, what is investing, how to start investing. They're up more than a third since January of 2020, just reflecting the growing interest among investors. Even on our very own Morningstar.com, where we obviously measure traffic very, very closely, we've seen not only a notable engagement in, 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 in the demographic of 25 to 34 year olds, but in the 18 to 24 year old demographic, we've seen a surge of nearly 150% of visitors to our site. So our team is meeting that demand with new kinds of investing content and, and design specifically su suited for those who are starting out. Because we believe we have a chance to empower and help these investors succeed. But what have I learned now looking at this a year later? Possibly the most important lesson that I think we're all witnessing is that tolerance for the establishment has evaporated. Tolerance for the establishment has evaporated. There is no better example or deep interest around this than in the GameStop mania that I know all of you have probably been paying attention to. The Reddit board is an in-group phenomenon that, success, that successfully mobilized itself against traditional Wall Street. And in this context, even Robin Hood, which Kathleen referenced earlier, is part of the establishment almost overnight, demonstrating a shift in both investor perception and investor power immediately. This event alone was significant in demonstrating the ripple effect of an organized few. On our Morningstar sites, for example, GameStop stock pages spiked from a really, really low average, about 500 page views a week at the end of the year, to more than 62,000 in the first week of February. You, I, and others were paying attention and were galvanized to look at exactly what was going on. In fact, the impact was felt ac across our entire site. But what you can see is that the surge in interest in GameStop and AMC, which, who, whose stock pages basically surged more than 6,500 and 2,500% respectively, 
were far, far greater than other stocks like Apple, which had an interest surge of more than 50%, Facebook, 80%, Coca-Cola, more than doubling. Those would be great numbers, but you look and compare to what you were seeing and completely, completely, it looks like a smaller picture. So investors are more emboldened to use their influence with their pocketbooks and their proxy votes to affect the change they want to see. Investor demands are being driven by the, are, are we, are investor demands are in fact driving out the long held notion of shareholder capitalism. That's what you probably studied to, to a certain degree in school too. And that core thing, and I learned this at the University of Chicago too, is that shareholder returns should come first in favor. And, and what's happening is you're seeing a rise instead in favor of a duty to all stakeholders, not just shareholders. That includes employees, customers, and communities. There aren't many industries that haven't been caught up in what's called the cancel culture this year. And no matter what you think of, it's a new landscape for every kind of firm to navigate. Just look at what happened to ce celebrity endorsed vegan milk darling Oatly. Got a little prop here because we're Oatly drinkers in our house. Such a friendly brand on one side, this package belongs to who? This is the boring side with calories. It's exactly what you would expect from a brand that's trying to stand out in that grocery aisle. You might even recall its Super Bowl commercial this year, which was fun and, and, and enlivening. But when Oatly announced last year that it was taking an investment from private equity firm Blackstone, there were all kinds of questions related to whether Blackstone had links to companies that were responsible for deforestation in Brazil. There were even questions about whether CEO Schwartzman's donations to the Trump campaign should draw scrutiny. All this was coming from a group of Oatly consumers who identified the brand in a certain way and felt that because of their action to take that money from Blackstone, that trust and engagement had in fact been broken. Now, I personally think Oatly's response was really well done and an important case study in the value of authenticity. You should take a look at it if you haven't. And the firm's now headed to an IPO, but not without realizing the role of the investor and a sharp, sharp eye for managing reputational risks related to ESG. And ESG and the power of investors really are coming to fruition through shareholder resolutions. Last year in 2020, 186 ESG-related shareholder resolutions appeared on proxy ballots for US companies. Average support was 28%, with 20 ESG-related resolutions achieving the support of a majority of shares voted, breaking the record of 14 set the year before. These are small numbers, but they're beginning to add up. More importantly, 67 of the 186 ESG related resolutions received at least 40% of the overall vote of minority outside shareholders. Think about that and see where the trend is heading. So what you're asking? Well, more investors and higher engagement among them are only positives, but they come with a real imperative for leadership from all of us. These new troops of investors need the right guides. They need sound education around long-term fundamentals and how to safeguard against predatory practices and hidden costs. We've always taken this responsibility seriously at Morningstar to advocate for investors and illuminate the trade-offs and pitfalls before them. And we'll be doing even more to serve up our long-term investing insights and tools to this rising generation of new investors. Trend number two that I'm gonna talk about today is that new sustainability factors are driving innovation in the way we invest. A year ago, I would have said that skyrocketing investor interest in non-balance sheet reference points and a focus on protecting against ESG was shaping investor preferences, particularly as more urgency was felt in the transition to a low carbon economy. That booming investor demand is driving significant asset flows to sustainable investing and also raising really valid concerns, I believe, about greenwashing and incomparability. 
Our goal at Morningstar is to help investors understand true ESG intentionality and material risks of investments versus what is just pure ESG marketing. We have formally integrated ESG into our analysis of all types of investment vehicles from stocks to funds to asset management firms. And, our, and we're, we're displaying it in our economic moat ratings, our ESG commitment level for strategies and asset managers. The idea is to blanket normal investments that you would look at with ESG related so that you can set yourself up for success when you're thinking about how you want to invest. We've even launched new indexes featuring firms that are doing the right things to set themselves up to succeed in a low carbon world. And note what I said here, because it's critical. Historically, indexes in the ESG space have been exclusionary. They've left out firms that perhaps have some type of a bad record. In our indexes, our aim is to include firms that we think will succeed in a low carbon world. And so the idea is to get inclusion based on the way you are operating. So what have I learned now in the past year that may be a little bit different? Well, the effects of sustainable investing have accelerated in the flow of capital and impacts along the value chain, including in some unforeseen ways. Spanning the spectrum of sustainable investing use cases, we see one extremely meaningful trend. And that is that sustainability factors are generating a robust evolving set of new data across the flow of capital that will have meaningful impact for investors of all types. Firstly, companies are embracing sustainability in a meaningful way, integrating sustainability metrics into their strategic planning and raising capital through sustainable investment tools. It's not just something to talk about anymore. Asset managers are seeking to create or optimize products to appeal to a growing contingent of investors interested in investing sustainably. Advisors are educating themselves and their clients to make even more personalized decisions around ESG. Retirement plan providers are now looking to the Department of Labor to give them guidance that will allow ESG to more fully appear in 401k plans, for instance. And credit rating agencies like our very own DBRS Morningstar are, are not only thinking about, but are actually taking ESG and substantiating ESG risk in the overall credit risk evaluation that they're performing. And finally, yes, even private equity firms are beginning to integrate ESG risk factors into their due diligence. In all of these instances, there's an aspect of people believing in ESG, and there's also a real aspect of people understanding that following this path actually also leads to good financial outcomes. Now, sustainable innovation across the industry is bringing new insights, choices, and trade-offs for investors. Long-standing philosophies and practices are shifting, and you have institutional investors like Calsters and PGGM modifying investment objectives to put consideration into natural resource dependency, human resource dependency, and long-term stewardship. You have corporate treasurers who would have thought suddenly embracing ESG. In fact, at the intersection of new government standards for sustainability and increased interest from institutional investors, corporate treasurers have found a new language to describe the intended use of funds raised through debt. Maybe you've heard things like green bonds or blue bonds or purple bonds or vanilla bonds. These are all new types of designations relating to firms that are trying to raise capital in a sustainable fashion. In fact, this week, MasterCard announced a large sustainable bond offering that'll be coming to market. Overall, the global sustainable debt market grew by nearly 30% to 732 billion in 2020. Included in that amount was about 150 billion in social bonds, which grew almost seven times in 2020. And those numbers are only going to get larger. Investors have a right to be informed with the new information to assess these familiar trade-offs. There will continue to be a healthy date about the bounds of fiduciary duty but the fiduciary process is not about a narrow outcome. A 
It's a holistic process of meeting an investor's goals. And after 2020, a holistic lens is more important than ever before. Integrating sustainability factors or, or a lens such as risk, onto a lens such as risk or return is no different than applying any other relevant factors because sustainability risks do materially impact the financial outcomes of investments positively or negatively. Now I've talked a lot about the E, but what about the S in ESG? And what about it particularly in the context of human, human capital? Last year, Black Lives Matter brought urgent momentum around confronting hard truths about inequality in our world and in our own industry, we saw a lot of banks, JP Morgan, Citigroup, Bank of America, commit billions to fight the racial wealth gap. These actions are unprecedented, and I believe it is investors who will be most successful in holding these companies to account. There's also that diversity and pay disclosure is on the rise. We've always thought that sunlight is a great disinfectant, so simply making this data available should lead to positive change. More than a dozen asset managers have just pledged to start revealing the demographic makeup of their workforce by race, ethnicity, and gender this year. And we're starting to see more firms commit to disclose this data, which was previously only privately reported as EEO-1 requirements here in the US. This is data that we at Morningstar are now collecting so we can provide transparency for investors given that was already available for pension funds. And then there's a magnifying glass on labor practices, which I can highlight by talking about everyone's favorite wild child, Tesla. Now, Tesla is considered a climate darling for its electric advancements. Yet, it doesn't score as well as you might think in terms of its ESG risk rating from Sustainalytics. Now, why is that, you might be wondering. It's because it falters on the S. It has faced criticism around the working conditions at its facilities, and it's been accused of breaching US labor laws. Those are real human capital concerns. And as an investor, you have the opportunity to think and weigh what matters to you most. Now, this isn't a topic that will soon lose spotlight because it does in fact pose real risk. In fact, nearly one quarter of all companies assessed by Sustainalytics face medium to high unmanaged risk related to their management of human resources. Sustainalytics looks at things, or looks at risks, sorry, related to scarcity of skilled labor, retention, recruitment, and training programs. Labor relations issues like the management of freedom and association and non-discrimination as well as working hours and wages. And if history shows, we can expect to see investors speak out for changes in this arena too. In fact, I believe investors are a force for good in this context. So what you're saying? Well, we anticipate continued sustainable innovation at every point in the investing ecosystem. Investors will win out in their demand for transparency and the continued evol evolution of ratings will put ESG consideration at investors' fingertips. The opportunity for all of today's fintechs in sustainable innovation are endless. And we look forward to supporting all of you in helping investors uncover their true preferences, goals, and their next base action in real time and in context to the life cycle and across multiple asset classes. Now, finally, my third trend is that structures are becoming more flexible so that the new here is wherever you are. I know, that's clever. <laughs> Investors have come to expect investing to fit their personal lives and values rather than the other way around. As a result, we all have an opportunity to see services evolve and even new investment vehicles emerge to accommodate uniquely individual goals and preferences, including the use of models and direct investing. So what is a model? To many of you, you may think of a strategy, but a model takes multiple strategies and put them, puts them together and delivers it to you. 
most robo, robo advisors are essentially delivering a model to the end investor. And what's direct invest, indexing? Direct indexing is a personalized form of indexing where you take a base index such as the Morningstar US market index and you personalize it based on your own personal ESG preferences, for example. So we're seeing a real surge in these types of offerings. On our own model marketplace at Morningstar, there are now almost 1400 models across more than 100 asset managers and strategies live in our software platform, Morningstar Direct. That's an increase of 83% in just the past seven months from around mid 2020. It is a space worth watching because we believe the demand for new vehicle types as will, will grow because they're less expensive, more scalable, and because of the interfaces and the interactions that fintechs are allowing, there's a greater amount of personalization in the delivery of these models. So as adoption grows, investors will need transparency in this otherwise opaque investment area. How do you know if, know if one is doing better than the other, for instance? You can expect to see Morningstar analyst ratings for models soon, as we're working to illum illuminate this part of the investing universe as well. So what I've learned now is that the industry is putting real weight behind making personalized portfolios a reality. It's no longer enough to propose great investment products. You've got to tie product proposals directly to client goals and a willingness to accept risk and outcomes. This can be the difference between disengaged in investors and ones who really care what their investments are about and who are focused on long-term outcomes. On the home front, Morningstar is well known for our role in the investment product space. But I think now that we are in the U space. We've been accelerating the rollout and integration, for example, of our Finimetrica risk profiling tool, which is an asset that's powerful in that it's a suitability solution that connects client risk and goals to investment recommendations. And we find that tools like this can really help personalize that experience. There's just no doubt, in fact, that investors have new opportunities for alternative and private equity exposure as well. If you look at PitchBook, there's just a growing number of these options available. As companies stay private longer and publicly traded stocks, at least until recently, have fallen in number, smaller investors have been boxed out of enjoying the gains in certain parts of the economy. There's a FOMO feeling on those kinds of growth opportunities. But the landscape is changing there too, and asset managers, such as T. Rowe Price and Fidelity, have been including pre-IPO shares in their stock portfolios for a few years now. You might be wondering why there are limitations here, but the 1933 and 1940 acts limit the ability of investment providers to pitch certain products widely, and income and wealth hurdles were instituted in 1982 that limited access to things like private equity funds, hedge funds, and things like that to just high earners or institutions. But in 2020, the definition of an accredited investor changed allowing smaller investors to access ALS if they were being advised by someone now deemed to be accredited. Another change in 2020 was the Department of Labor declaring that it was okay for individual retirement options offered to employees to start including private equity, as long as they were guided by an expanded list of accredited investors. Many see the first inroads of private equity into 401ks as a limited portion of a target date fund though asset managers are all looking at this and thinking about their next steps. In fact, I think I just read yesterday that KKR is looking to, to offer something in this space. Now, pe people are shaking free from the old guard's way of accessing capital. Entrepreneurs no longer need that investment bank or hedge fund for an idea to take flight. In just a week or so, new rules approved by the SEC will allow companies to raise 5 million every year by selling equity through crowdfunding. That's five times as much as is allowed now. And there will be no limit to what an accredited investor can put in. We're also seeing more uptake in flexible avenues to IPOs, 
Some of the largest VC-backed businesses are opting for direct listing, seeing Roblox and Coinbase, enterprise data software providers, Databricks and UiPath, both raising massive VC financing with the idea of going to direct listing possibly. Now at Morningstar, we're big believers of that. In fact, when we came public in 2005, we did an auction IPO. That year was just Morningstar and Google that did auction IPOs. And I've always wondered why more companies have not followed that path. And I've been glad to see the direct listings. Of course, you've also probably heard of special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs, sometimes referred to as blank check companies, which have also become all the rage. There were more than 250 of them in 2020 that raised more than 75 billion. And so far this year, we've already seen 60% of that amount take flight in 2021. A lot of what's going on here boils down though to the fact that people are maybe trying to make a quick buck and investor beware when it comes to SPACs. If you're interested in SPACs, take a look at PitchBook. We've got a lot of interesting information in there, but I will say when I look at the IPO market, I'm less excited about SPACs and definitely more excited about direct listings and auction IPOs. So what, and where do we go from here? Well, we expect that fintechs can and will continue tackling new questions and opening new possibilities to empower investors beyond simply using frontier technologies to make all things go faster and cheaper. It's valuable, but that's not the only thing. With more investors engaging new vehicles and outcome-based processes to achieve personalized investing experiences, the financial industry is on a path to master the concept of knowing the investor, knowing the investor. And with the growing accessibility of a broader range of private and public investment options, fintechs are poised to curate the expanding sea of choices for a wider field of investors with tools and insights attuned to each unique context operating in real time. This leadership is imperative as individuals navigate complex environments at the intersection of investments, banking, payments, health, and yes, social media. So the growth of global FinTech sits at the intersection of these waves. It's ripe for new types of investors to engage when and how they want, and in ways that are unique to them and the goals that they believe will make them successful. The rapid innovation against an accelerated rate of change means more nimble contenders have very real opportunities to unseat incumbents. But the incumbents are also awake and moving as quickly as I've seen them. So with all this opportunity comes a chance for responsible leadership to protect against some of the stumbles we have seen in past periods where things have seemed so good. So as I reflect on a really strange year where at a personal level with the pandemic, it was hard to feel great about things. And yet on a professional level to see all this wonderful change taking place in our industry. It reminds me that one thing hasn't changed and that is having a true north. Doing the right thing by the investor and by your stakeholders will never steer you wrong. And as you think about charting your next course, think not only about how you can build a successful business, but how you can do so in a way that connects to all your stakeholders in a sustainable and thoughtful manner. Thanks for allowing me to speak to you and I look forward to the rest of this conference today. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thanks Kunal. That was an amazing conversation and so exciting to hear about the right way to empower beginning investors and more substantive ways to measure ESG and the holy grail of investing, personalization and customization around the right variables and data. Very, very cool. 